station on my computer just said no. Um, can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you perfectly, David. I'm sure okay, cool. Get, they can't okay, so, so. Um, inotropes, uh, a little bit about why we need them, how, we, how they work, and then uh, towards the end, a little bit of the practicalities in terms of how do we actually use them uh, in real terms. So the first thing is just uh, as a little bit of a reminder, we have uh, this concept of capillary circulation, which is to do with diffusion, and it's driven by a number of things. And the two ones that we're really worried about um, is flow, and the flow is driven by pressure. And we know that in the vascular space, there's also gonna be some push and some pull pressures, depending on the fluid contents as they get to the, the target tissue, some osmotic pressures and some hydrostatic pressures. Um, the ones that we're interested in from tonight's perspective though are going to be flow and pressure because those are the ones that in real terms we can have something um, to do with. It's interesting because in fact, in the world of, of shock and shock management, there's, there's a couple of schools of thought um, and the eminent speaker we had last night, Prof Dickerson will say that uh, when you're dealing with, with specialists in the world, you're either going to deal with flow monkeys or you're going to deal with pressure monkeys. Um, I sit in the middle and I like to believe that when you're managing perfusion, you actually have to take into consideration both flow and pressure uh, at your peril to forget one or the other. So every time we're going to be dealing with inotropes or fluid dynamics, you have to worry about the flow and the pressure. Reminding ourselves, of course, that there's a couple of things that will have impacts on those. The first one is the viscosity of the fluid. Um, we know that blood is reasonably um, consistent, although what we're seeing with some of our inflammatory disorders and what we're seeing with some of the COVID uh, information that's coming out is that there is an increased viscosity um, in a lot of these patients, which is why we're seeing some of the end organ uh, damage issues that we're seeing, strokes and the like. We know that vessel length affects the flow. So the longer the vessel, the more it affects the flow between branches. And also the vessel radius will affect the flow and will affect the flow by affecting the pressure. So we know that a lot of our anotropic agents are directly responsible for affecting the, ves the vessel radius. Uh, and that's how it does what it does to, to blood pressure. We just need to remind ourselves that as much as we're, we're always measuring the main vessel blood, uh, blood pressure, by the time it gets to capillary beds, the pressure actually has almost nothing to do with the pressures that we traditionally measure. So this concept of systolic and diastolic is a, is a major vessel concept. It is not a concept that has a lot to do with capillaries. We're more interested when it comes to capillaries into what, what the mean pressure is. Um, obviously, the mean pressure is affected by the diastolic and the systolic. Um, and it's more a combination of the pressure coupled with flow when we're looking at that. We're just as interested in what the pressures are going to be on the, ve on the venous end, because if the pressures on the venous end are starting to build up, then it doesn't matter. You can have the best blood pressure at the one end of the vascular bed, but if the resistance at the other end is so high, you're going to get no flow through the vessels and the perfusion is going to be poor. So the vascular resistance on the venous end is, is just as important as the driving pressure on the arterial end when we're looking at uh, perfusion of tissues. So that's just a little bit of a, a anatomical and physiological kind of whirlwind tour and reminder of what we're, what we're worried about. Just in terms of the, of the path, we're remembering that there's a couple of different issues around the world of shock. And I'm, I'm hoping everybody's comfortable with the fact that I don't draw four neat little blocks in terms of describing different times of shock, because in fact, the different types of shock will generally overlap with each other um, in terms of them having a different element. So for example, like, even though cardiac tamponade is, is primarily an obstructive type of shock, it has an element of cardiogenic failure because of the filling problem and fairly soon thereafter, the, the muscular failure. Where things like anaphylaxis are, are usually distributive or vasodilatory in nature, they do have an element of hypervolemia in how they behave. So whenever we're looking at the patient that we're dealing with, we need to understand what type of shock we're dealing with. 
Because if you throw the wrong therapy at the patient, it's going to have no effect. And in fact, in some of the patients, will have a reasonably deleterious effect. Um, you know, for, for example, spinal shock is a, is a predominantly or almost all vasodilatory um, issue. If you were just to throw large amounts of fluid at it, it may improve the situation, but you probably want to do something about the vasodilation. And similarly, if you had hypovolemic shock, if you only threw an inotrope at the patient, uh, you would increase his rate of bleeding potentially. So before you even want to think about an inotrope, you've got to understand what is going on with the patient in front of you to make sure we, want, we don't want to go down the, the wrong road. Um, probably the, the nightmare example would be the patient that has a tension pneumothorax, which has some obstructive shock, and we treat it with adrenaline because we haven't resolved the problem and we haven't introduced the therapy that's going to help the patient by any means. So it can sometimes be a little bit tricky working out, so which, which is the inotrope that I want to use? Um, and there's a number of different approaches to take on, on selecting an inotrope if you're in a setting that you have to be the one to select it. Um, sometimes you may be in the situation where you only have one inotrope and the decision is made for you. So you open the drug drawer and there's only one inotrope lying there. Well, easy, you're going to use that inotrope. Sometimes you're going to base it on pathophysiology. And here's where we maybe just need to remind ourselves, I'll come back to that slide, remind ourselves a little bit about what the different effects of the different inotropes are. So we're really worried about alpha, beta, and dopamine effects. Understanding that alpha uh, adrenergic effects, we usually look at alpha-1, um, will cause vasoconstriction in the vascular walls, and will have an increased uh, contractility of cardiac muscle without a change in rate. So any drug that is purely alpha isn't going to give you a massive rate change. Um, it's just going to make the, the contraction stronger. If you want a rate change, you've got to go and look for a beta-1 agonist, uh, which will give you a greater rate. Um, and then counter to that, beta-2s will give you vasodilation. So just quickly, half a step back, because it's not always clear, and certainly not always clear in the textbooks when they, when they talk about this. When we're talking about these alpha and beta um, effects, we're talking about receptor sites. We're not necessarily always talking about the drug, because a lot of drugs will have effects on all of the receptors. Different receptors are found in different concentrations in, in different areas. So for example, we know that uh, beta-2 receptors are focused around renal vasculature. Uh, beta-2 receptors are focused around um, lung tissue vasculature, where you have more beta-1 uh, receptors in cardiac tissue, you have more alpha-1 receptors in, in vessels. So that kind of explains why you can give a drug that, that will have one effect in one part of the body and will have a different effect in the different part of the body. It's got to do with what, what are the receptors in those spaces. Dopamine is even more interesting in that dopamine is also, uh, to a certain extent, dose dependent on the effects that it'll have. So at different doses, it will affect different receptors, which is why dopamine, they'll talk about different dose ranges having different effects on different parts of the body. As some people like pictures, uh, that, like me, they're easier to understand, um, and I'll put it into a table in a moment. But for example, if you're looking at, a, at the vessels, which are the two top kind of circles, if you're looking to vasoconstrict them, you want an alpha-1 uh, agonist. If you're looking to vasodilate it, you want a dopamine receptor agonist. Um, if you're looking at making beat slightly friendly or slightly gently, a beta-2. If you're looking for a stronger cardiac contraction, you're looking for beta-1. And the arrows are kind of linked. Um, and you'll see that adrenaline, which is probably the one that most people are the most familiar with, will have both alpha-1 and beta-1 effects. So it will give you an increased rate and it will give you vasoconstriction on receptors or receptor sites in those spaces. Um, the problem with adrenaline is that it doesn't have any vasodilation effects, uh, which is part of its, its drawback. Um, noradrenaline, which is not as available in most settings, uh, will behave similarly, where phenyl or phenylephrine uh, is just a vasoconstrictor. 
Um, and my suggestion is that outside of the, the critical care space, uh, it's often used in, in a lot of ICUs, uh, phenol is probably the one that we're going to be reaching for the, the least or, or the last because it's got a very narrow therapeutic range. So you've got to be really careful in terms of controlling it. Um, and it also really just gives you massive vasoconstriction, which is in some patients desirable, but you've got to be quite on top of controlling uh, flows when you're using it. Um, dobutamine will give us really good inotropic effects and dopamine, depending on the dose that you're using, will give you different effects, either vasoconstriction, vasodilation, or uh, increased rate effects. I'll put that into a table. Some people prefer tables because they're a little bit more analytical in how they think. Um, those are the different inotropes kind of speaking to, to their effects. And as you can see, dopamine is also laid out um, in terms of its dose ranges. A lot of people will combine a lot of their inotropes depending on the effects that they're looking for. Uh, and in some patients, this, this is appropriate. And in some patients, it's clutching at straws. So just because the one inotrope doesn't work, it doesn't necessarily mean that adding an additional inotrope is going to make it better. If you want to add an inotrope, you need to add the inotrope that is going to be complementary to the inotrope that you're already using. Um, the classic example is maybe you're, you're using high doses of adrenaline and you're wanting to try to protect uh, renal flow. So you may want to add dopamine in really um, low doses to try and stimulate uh, a renal flow. So that, that's a complementary uh, example. Uh, but for example, adding high doses of adrenaline with high doses of dibutamine uh, may not particularly be beneficial because you're doing uh, the same drug on the same receptor sites and it's not going to, it's not a two plus two equals four situation. And um, once the receptor sites are fully functioning, they're fully functioning and an additional inotrope is not going to be better. A lot of units will have their own particular preferences in terms of which inotropes they use, depending on who runs the unit. And there's not really enough, particularly in the, the there's a bit of a debate between do, dopamine and dobutamine, there's not really enough in it to have a fight about which one they're going to use. Um, you can quite comfortably go with whatever is that unit's standard inotropic choice. Just in terms of the, the, the step back and, and just looking at, so which type of shock are we dealing with and what is the, the strategy? Hypervolemic, which is the one that we, we sort of maybe the most familiar with, is you know, the blood loss example. Before we even think about touching inotropes, we should be thinking about replacing the lost volume. And we should be replacing the same fluid as far as possible. So a patient that's lost two liters of blood from a gunshot wound won't benefit a lot from replacing it with two liters of ringers. Um, we know that all that's going to happen is that he's going to clot less because we're going to dilute all of the clotting factors. Um, we potentially will drive up the, the pressure and drive up the flow, which is uh, potentially going to make the rate of bleeding worse. So if we're going to replace fluids uh, for hypovolemia or for, for blood loss, ideally we should be replacing it with blood, um, depending on its availability, of course. And only especially only once we've got control of the hemorrhage, or if it's completely life-threatening, should we be thinking about anotropic support. Um, in the world of penetrating trauma, anotropic support is, is maybe not a good idea at all, particularly if it's uncontrollable hemorrhage. Um, we should be tolerating maybe lower blood pressures in those patients and just staying on top of the flow, uh, rather than trying to chase blood pressures too hard. The cardiogenic patients are the ones that are a bit more challenging because obviously we want to provide as much support as possible. And at the same time, we want to make, we want to attempt to remove whatever resistance is there. So we want to try and reduce off the load um, as much as possible. So we want to be doing things like positioning the patient uh, in the best possible position, uh, which is usually in a semi finalist position. And um, once the blood pressure is adequate, we can start thinking about tapping off excess fluid. Um, before we even start trying to drive up the cardiac function too, too much. Um, we spoke a little bit the other night when we mentioned adrenaline. 
adrenaline in cardiac patients, while it may be the drug that we end up having to use in a lot of the patients, will drive the oxygen demand even higher, potentially making the problem worse. So a lot of the cardiac patients, I'd rather put them on a dobutamine uh, or a dopamine in the right dose, uh, because it may be a little bit more cardiac protective. It won't drive the rate up as much, but it'll give the inotropic or the strength of contraction support uh, and maybe a little bit safer than adrenaline. Um, we may want to use one of the agents. It's also vasodilation. Again, dopamine in the right dose, dobutamine to a certain extent. Some of the others are more known um, because it will reduce the resistance in the vessels that the blood has to pump out against. Um, distributive shock, so the septic shock patient where uh, he's got massive leaky vessels and all the fluid is tending to push out into, into spaces. Again, we can push a little bit of fluid into those patients. Um, you know, that the anaphylactic shock is maybe the classic example where we can give large volumes of fluid. Um, sepsis as well will target or will tolerate large volumes of fluid. And then we want to use a, a vasoconstrictor. Uh, and adrenaline is probably the most preferred agent in, in the distributive shock patients. So it's spinal shock, septic shock. And um, just a quick little note while we're talking about septic shock, the patients in sepsis, they often get large amounts of fluid and the blood pressure doesn't respond. And then we give them large amounts of an inotrope, so adrenaline, for example, and they don't respond. And then we sit there a little bit confused because everybody's told us that we should do, just give large volumes of fluid and large volumes of adrenaline and the blood pressure will come back. The challenge with, with particularly sepsis is that often those receptor sites are so clapped out from having been in kind of this adrenal state that the receptor sites almost become dulled down. And at the same time, uh, the adrenal glands above the kidneys stop being able to produce as much endogenous adrenaline. And again, because they've been doing it for a period of time. So one of the, the kind of things to always just keep in the back of your mind is for, particularly for those septic patients, that one of the agents to add to the mix uh, is just going to be a loading dose of cortisone. And that stress dose of cortisone, uh, five milligrams per kilogram, uh, can often reanimate the receptors and assist the adrenals in just pushing out some more uh, natural uh, and endogenous adrenaline. Um, in the obstructive uh, group of patients, so the cardiac tamponade, the tension pneumothorax, uh, those are mechanical problems and the mechanical problem should be resolved. Um, you know, giving adrenaline to a cardiac tamponade will serve no purpose, uh, remove the obstructive cause. So this is just kind of bringing us back to the fact that you, you've got to know which of these you're dealing with. Uh, and in, unfortunately, in some cases, which combination of these are you dealing with so that you can pick the right therapeutic approach uh, before you even start thinking about inotropes. But let's move past that now and let's say, so we've decided that this is a patient that does require inotropes and we're going to head down that road. The first thing, and I was always amazingly daunted by these machines, is because they came in so many different shapes and sizes. They all had different things on their buttons and I usually had to wander off to go and find a smart ICU nurse to go and help me out just to switch the thing on. So if you're going to be working in a setting where you're going to be needing to work with these, if you're not familiar with them, um, go and get an empty syringe, if it's a syringe driver, and have somebody just walk you through the basics of these devices because they're actually not that complicated once you get to know the interface with them. You know, which button does what? How do I load and unload the syringe? Um, and unfortunately, there's not kind of one generic, this is how we do it with all of them. Uh, because each manufacturer has gone and made what they think is a smart option. So, for example, if you just look at those three there, um, they've all got completely different interfaces um, and different ways of, as I say, just switching them on is, is a challenge. Um, there's a few things that are probably common. And it's going to depend on the setting you're working in, how you set them up. Most modern syringe drivers, and while we're talking about syringe drivers, um, we're also talking about uh, infusion pumps, which I'll, I'll mention in a moment. Most modern uh, syringe drivers will actually guide you through your settings. So if you have a look at the top left one there, somebody's put in settings for morphine, and the device will actually ask you questions like, what is the weight of the patient? 
and what is the dose that you wish to give the patient. And it will then do the calculations for you, um, which is obviously very nice because then you don't have to do maths. And I don't know about anybody else, but maths, when I'm sitting with a stressed patient, I'm not great. So if the, if the device has got the ability to do calculations for you, work out how, how to get to those settings and use the calculations. Um, it's probably the safer way of doing it rather than us trying to do maths, especially when we're stressed. Know that there's a start and a stop button on all of these devices. So start infusing and stop infusing. Um, and they will all have a way of somewhere on the screen showing you that the infusion is running or the, the infusion is stopped. Um, just be sure that you can tell which one it is because it's all great setting it up and then thinking that it's running and then it's actually not. Uh, and just as a note, most modern syringe drivers will take any syringes. So you don't have to necessarily get the propriety ones from the manufacturer. They'll take any syringe. So uh, there's one or two that are still a little bit tricky on that. Um, but most modern ones don't. Infusion pumps are a similar idea, except that instead of having to fill a syringe with a drug, you put your drug in a normal um, infusion bag. And you then tell the machine how quickly to let the fluid go through. And that can be anything from the, the very complicated multi kind of controlling devices uh, to the simple uh, line controlling. Just the image across the right is just an idea about how they actually work. They're either a roller or a, what they call fingers linear or a peristaltic pump, um, which is how it controls the amount of fluid. And these devices are particularly accurate. Um, they've been calibrated, as long as they're calibrated, in terms of controlling exactly how much fluid is going to be given to the patient. Um, so between the two of them, and I say, unfortunately, there's just so many different devices available. And then every now and again, a manufacturer tries to be smart and they combine stacks, or the nurse goes and combines stacks on you and goes and puts a infusion pump together with a syringe driver just to confuse the issue. Um, although that's a fairly nice way of packing it closely. So those are kind of the devices they're going to face with us. Um, my suggestion, as I mentioned, is just make sure you've spent a little bit of time playing with the device before you need to use it on a patient. So you can do the basic functions. You know, how do I load the syringe? These, there's one in this picture. If you don't know how to load the syringe, you're going to be, the potential will break it before you work out how to even get the syringe into it. But unfortunately, sometimes the world is not simple and we're faced with a patient that desperately needs support now and we don't have time to go and work things out and find things pretty and, and do it. So sometimes we have to save the patient's life and then and make it nice afterwards. And in those situations, use the, uh, use the inotrope that we're all the most familiar with, which is usually going to be adrenaline. Most people are the most comfortable with adrenaline and it's going to be the agent of choice that we can use just quickly to get it um, or to get the patient sorted out very fast. So they talk about dirty adrenaline um, and all that they mean by dirty adrenaline is we're, we're kind of throwing maths out for a moment while we're trying to save our patient's life. So you throw one, some people throw two milligrams of adrenaline into a liter of saline. It's probably the other reason it's dirty is that it's gone into saline, dirty water. And uh, mix it up and what you then have is a one microgram per milliliter solution. And it's got two benefits. The one is that if you have the desperately hypertense of about to die patient in front of you, you can give them what is good called a push dose presser or push dose adrenaline, which is just 20 to 30 moles of that bag as a push dose. So 20 micrograms or 30 micrograms of adrenaline as a push dose. This is the patient that is, that is literally dying in front of you. you. Maybe you've done a procedure like a, an RSI, you've, you've gone and intubated the patient and their blood pressure just disappears uh, as soon as the procedure is done. It, it's going to take a while to get the adrenaline infusion up and running and sorted. You can quickly just give them a push dose presser and that will last them a couple of minutes while you get everything else ready. Um, it's probably a good suggestion that if we're doing really high risk procedures in patients that are on the edge from a hemodynamic status, that we have some dirty adrenaline or some push dose adrenaline ready, uh, drawn up if they're really unstable. So that if their blood pressure just tanks immediately, we can quickly just push in a push dose 
um, presser and keep them going until uh, things settle down. You can then put that onto a, an infusion, but it's going to be quite a high flow rate infusion because it's quite a low concentration. In fact, it's a, some people will call it almost homeopathic dose uh, adrenaline for an infusion. You're going to have to be doing large volumes to actually get any, any infusion out of it. But for that emergency situation, we're just trying to keep somebody alive. It's a nice thing to have around. Because you can just put the bag up, hang it with a, with a micro dropper, with a 60 dropper, and just let it drop at a drop a second, two drops a second, three drops a second, until you get a blood pressure. While somebody's setting up a formal adrenaline infusion. Because that can take time. Uh, and a patient that is hemodynamically on the edge, if you let their blood pressure drop for a couple of minutes, um, they will go into cardiac arrest before you have your proper adrenaline infusion mixed up. So that little, little rescue us, get us out of trouble card, um, the dirty adrenaline, which can be used either as a push dose or as a, as a short-term infusion. And I, I stress that it's a short-term infusion. It's while we're getting the formal infusion ready. Then while we're talking about formal infusions, everybody goes, well, how much do I, you know, how do I know a formal infusion? How do I, how do I get it? And the easy answer is read the manual. Most good ICUs will have infusion charts. So they'll have a manual somewhere with charts in them where they will describe how much adrenaline goes into, how much fluid and how fast I run it depending on the patient's weight. And you can't go wrong with the chart. Charts are there for not necessarily just three o'clock in the morning, but maybe three o'clock in the afternoon. We were a little bit tired. We're not quite on top of our game and we actually don't want to make the mathematical error. We don't want to make a, a, a decimal mistake. It's always a good idea that even if you know the adrenaline uh, concentration and you know the flow rates, to just open the chart and check. Um, you know, giving adrenaline at, at a tenth of the suggested dose will mean that it won't work, and giving it at, at ten times the suggested dose may have, in a in a sensitive cardiac patient, may have catastrophic effects from it from a myocardial tissue perspective. So just if there if there is a, if there's a manual, look it up. If you're not sure and you don't have a manual, uh, open an app on a phone and look it up. If you're stuck in the middle of nowhere, and it does sometimes happen, that there's just absolutely no other way of doing, doing it and there's nothing to look it up. The safe adrenaline dose is this one. Um, and you mix it either three milligrams into 50, so that's if you're gonna use a syringe in a 50 mil syringe, so three milligrams plus, correctly, 47 moles of fluid, uh, or 12 milligrams in 188 moles of fluid. And the reason that we use that concentration is that whatever you set your moles per hour at on your, on your syringe driver will be your micrograms per minute. And uh, we're not going to go through the maths of that. It, it, it's true. It, it promise it works. Whatever you set your moles per hour at will be your micrograms per minute. And I'll show you an example in, in a moment of how that works. And we just need to remember that our adrenaline dose is, uh, depending on the literature, is either 0 0.05 or 0.1 to one micrograms per kilogram per minute. Sure, there's a lot of maths. So this is maybe looking at an example just to kind of work it out. And let's say we have a 100 kilogram patient. That means that if we do that 0.1 to one dose, their dose is 10 to 100 mics per minute. I always work it the other way around and I go, well, if I've got an 80 kilogram patient, I can go up to 80 micrograms per minute. And I take off a zero to work out the minimum dose. So it's eight to 80 for an 80 kilogram patient. 6 to 60 for a 60 kilogram patient. You can see where I'm going. And then I know that if I've mixed it up at that, at that concentration, the 3 and 50 or the 12 and 200, that when I'm setting my, my infusion pump or my syringe driver, I do 6 to 60, 7 to 70, 8 to 80, depending on their weight, as moles per minute. And I'm in the dose range. And the easy way to start it is start at the lower end and go up until you get the blood pressure that you want depending on the clinical uh, condition of the patient. Head injury is slightly higher, cardiac patients may be slightly lower, trauma without a head injury may be lower, whatever the, the target blood pressure that you want. So start low and just keep going up until you get the blood pressure you want. You probably want to wait about a minute to two minutes between each increase in, in infusion, understanding that if the perfusion is really bad or the circulation is really bad, it's going to take a long time for that adrenaline to get to 
particularly the, the myocardial muscle to have an effect. Um, probably also just good to, to remember that ideally inotropes are run through central lines. So as far as possible, we, we want a CVP line before we're doing inotropes, but we're not going to delay starting an inotrope because we don't have a central line. Um, we can start the inotrope on a, on a larger bore, well-running or very patent peripheral line while we are getting the central line sorted out. Don't withhold it because I don't have a central line. Start it on a peripheral line. Just make sure that it's a, it's a well-sighted, well-running peripheral line. And then get somebody to sort out the central line and then we can move the, the inotrope over once that line is sorted out. But don't delay it. Um, because you don't have a central line. And just a couple of practical tips. The, the top left corner, the left -hand corner are these, these dialer flow devices. They are very unreliable or very inaccurate. And the problem with them is that it's, it, all it does is it controls the diameter of the tube flowing through it. So the, the height of the, if you're using an uh, infusion bag, the height of the infusion bag of the patient will have an effect on the flow. So you can set it at one thing and then you lift the bag up and the flow will change. So they're really not accurate and we shouldn't be relying on dialer flows for anotrope infusions. They're fine for, you know, if we're just giving fluid and uh, maintenance fluid inf infusions to patients because the accuracy is not that important. But for, for anotropes, they're not accurate enough. The top right, right hand, I'm just talking about when you're mixing it up. And the, the, the important thing or the, the error that, that some people make is that they draw up the drug or they use the tubing that connects everything to, to draw up the drug. Um, the step should be you put the fluid in your syringe or you already have fluid in your infusion bag. Then you add the drug to your syringe or your infusion bag and you mix it. You should actually physically mix it into the fluid. And then you use that premix, so that 50 milliliters, to prime. A lot of these ICU patients that have got multiple lines hanging all over the place, they'll just put the bag up uh, without priming the line. And that means that the, the inotrope is only in the bag and at the very top of the infusion line. And if the infusion line is running at a really low volume of up to about 15 to 20 moles, Moles an hour, it's going to take a full hour before the infusion even gets. Line should be primed with the fluid that we're going to be administering, with the, with the fluid that's got the drug already mixed in it. Um, and then the bottom one is please don't forget to label whatever uh, bag you put it in. Um, you wouldn't want to you know, hang a bag, a, a litre of saline, but you've already mixed a fairly large dose of adrenaline in, and then somebody comes past the patient and goes, oh, I need to give this patient a fluid bolus. And they bolus them with half a litre of ringers that also happens to have a significant amount of adrenaline in. Uh, that could be catastrophic. Similarly, if it's got potassium, please remember to label it. Um, the image that I haven't put there that I wanted to talk about also was three-way taps. Um, for some reason, a lot of people just get caught out by three-way taps. Um, Spend a moment just, you know, studying which way, if, if, if there are three-way taps involved in any of the connections, just make sure that they're actually open in the right directions. Um, I've seen lots of patients having really bad blood pressures with inotropes running and alarms going off because there's high resistance, or to be found that all we had was one tap in the process, it was just turned in the wrong direction. So just focus on the three-way taps. And probably the most important thing is, is what is our end goal? How do we know that we're getting either the pressure or the flow right. How do I know that I don't have to go up with my fluid? How do I know I don't have to go up with my inotropes? How do I know I'm in the right place? And there's probably three things that we can be looking at. The first one is how well is my brain functioning? So I hope, we're hoping that we have a patient that we're able to interact with because if, if the level of consciousness, in other words, if the cerebral perfusion is good enough that they're able to be completely wide awake and interacting, well, their brain is perfused and we're reasonably comfortable around what their, what their pressures are like. Um, I will sometimes also speak to, to how quickly did their, their pressure actually change? How quickly did they get to that hypertensive state? If it was over a long period of time, the brain tolerates it and they'll stay awake uh, for, for much lower pressures than if it was a sudden drop. 
So just measuring level of consciousness is a really good marker of where are we with inotropes and where are we with fluid. Um, renal output, so just straight ur measuring urine, urine output is also a really good one to know where we are from a fluid uh, perspective. If we're, if we're starting to do lots of inotropes and we're still getting good renal output, we're very happy because we know that a lot of the inotropes will be vasoconstrictive in, in the kidney, which will tend to shut down kidney function. So which kind of that delicate balance of trying to say, I want to give enough inotrope that I'm getting a good blood pressure, but I don't want to be limiting the flow. And the kidneys are kind of one of our early markers in terms of how much are we limiting flow to end organs. So most patients in these settings should be catheterized so that we can make sure we're on top of renal output. And then obviously we're worried about the heart. So there's a bunch of markers we can look at there. We can measure straight good old fashioned blood pressure, bearing in mind that we're often only measuring central blood pressure. Um, but unless you have some fairly fancy equipment, you're not able to measure the really um, peripheral blood pressure. But we can do more with, with the heart as well. So if you're skilled with an ultrasound probe, you can go and look at how well are some of the, the, the direct cardiac functions. So you can go and actually look at the heart and see how is the, the ventricle behaving, for example. So if the ventricle is looking really, really lazy, you may want to, thank you for somebody adding arrows, um, you may want to add some sort of inotropic support to make the, the cardiac, mass, cardiac muscle behave better. If you see the inferior vena cava and that they're completely flat and collapsing all the time, you may want to consider topping up the fluids a lot more aggressively. Um, cool. Have any questions at this point? I saw there was a couple of, of questions that had popped up. Just going to open the chat on a different screen. Dave, I must admit, I can't see any questions. Can you see any questions? No, there's no questions. That's cool. Is there anybody who wants to type a question? Yes, from Steve Cornish. As the lung capillaries are clotting up, how does an inotrope help? Okay, so the inotrope is not going to help directly on the on the lung clotting. That's why we're hopefully putting them on some sort of um, clotting control regimen, depending on what the unit is. But uh, clexane is a standard in, in all of the patients. Um, is certainly a good idea. But yes, if they they're becoming obstructive, so obstructive shock is not one of the ones that responds particularly well to inotropes. Particularly if it's microvascular clotting, um, anotropes are not going to be the patient's friend at all. Is that just a stunned silence? because that's what I wanted to say about inotropes. Um, uh, Dave, just remind everyone that they are muted. So if they need a yeah, question. If, you, if you're trying to talk, you need to type. Cool. Yeah. Okay, well, um, the network is very bad, says Gina. Is there something you want to do to ask Gina? I think we're load shedding everywhere. So I think if you're able to get on, um, you're blessed. Uh, we've yeah. had quite a lot of load shedding happening. But anyway, it's just to soften the blow of COVID. We just add load shedding. So it's cool. Um, if there are no other questions, Dave, are you, are you finished? Oh, Shivani. Shivani, raise the hand. Shivani, um, I'm not sure if I can unmute you, Shivani. Uh, Hi, Maddie. I've just unmuted Shivani. Okay, there you go, Shivani. You're unmuted. Oh, I, I did unmute and then went back on mute. Let me try again. Because you've got to teach me this. <laughs> there, Shivani, you should be unmuted now. You can try talk. Hi. Um, I've heard from practitioners who've had um, a lot of experience in the Western Cape that um, 
when they are called to the wards to intubate um, COVID patients, um, the um, drugs that they use to sedate the patients before intubation actually uh, push the patients into cardiac arrest. The reason being that um, a lot of the patients are on um, high flow uh, nasal oxygen um, and they are not eating and drinking for uh, days on end. And uh, they are extremely hypovolemic. So um, one of the first things we should consider is um, doing uh, fluid boluses for these patients before even attempting, for example, um, sedating them for intubation because um, the hypovolemic status causes cardiac arrest. Yeah. I think that's an excellent suggestion, and it probably holds true for every single intubation, and maybe particularly these ones. But but just going in and giving RSI agents to any patient, especially if they're on the edge from some perspective, is a dangerous practice. And a, a fluid bolus, probably in them a, a slightly bigger fluid bolus, you know, 500 mole kind of range, as you're giving or, or before you give any RSI agent, is good practice uh, in all patients. Um, you know, resuscitate before you intubate is, is maybe one of the mantras that we heard around. Um, but thank, that's a very good point. Thank you. Um, you know, they're, they're right on the edge. They're, they're being intubated because they're right on the edge. Um, and, a, and a fluid bolus is an excellent idea. Uh, so, David, I've got another question from um, Denis Allard in Cape Town. He says using inotropes during trauma equals hemorrhagic shock is usually a no-no during hemorrhagic shock. I've met doctors that do use inotropes in recess. Your point on this? Yeah, so in, in trauma, it is quite a, quite a debated one. And I would say that, that inotropes are reserved for the patient that's about to die. So in other words, the patient that is, that is peri-arrest and we're just trying to keep them alive for a little bit longer until... They can get blood. Um, obviously, the issue with inotropes is that uh, they, they certainly shouldn't be routinely used in trauma, but the, the issue is that they stimulate or they cause more bleeding. Um, the little double-edged sword, it may be a drug that, that keeps their heart beating a little bit longer, but empties their system quicker. So certainly in, in my teaching, it has been that it's it's one of the tools in trauma, but it's a very late, uh, late tool. Maybe a little bit sooner in head injuries that need a higher pressure to keep the brain alive. But good to see your name again, Denny. Um, the next one was, how do you administer the quick fix adrenaline and 20 mole solution? So that was what we call that dirty adrenaline, which is really putting an amp into a thousand moles. And we can either use it as a rush infusion or just taking 20 moles of that in the syringe and giving it as a, as a push dose presser. The, the patient that's, that's hypoxic and, bre and not maybe not hypoxic because they should be oxygenated, not given an iron trip. It's a bad example. But the patient who maybe we're going through the RSI process and it's, they're, they're, they're incredibly sick, they're on the edge, just giving them a little push dose pressure to keep them alive while we're sorting out the iron trip. So, so 20 moles of that, of that litre. Um, a question of quad strength adrenaline over double strength adrenaline. This is one of my favorite fights that I have in ICU. Uh, the difference between quad strength and double strength is how fast is the concentration that it's mixed in. So if you're giving quad strength or double strength, it just means you're putting more in, uh, in the bag. You've still got to know how much, you, how much adrenaline you're giving a minute. Um, and it holds true for any of the inotropes, not just adrenaline, but whether you're doing dopamine or dopamine, they also do double strength and all sorts of things with, with, with all of the inotropes. The dose is the dose. Um, and what I mean by that is the dose range of, for example, adrenaline is 0.1 to 1 mics per kilo. The dose of uh, dopamine 1 to 10. Um, whether you do, if, if you're doubling up the strength of adrenaline, it just means that you can potentially give it a little bit faster because the mixture is stronger. Once you start going, and again, I use adrenaline because it's the one most people are familiar with. Once you start going to more than one um, mic per kilo per minute, 
it starts just being a waste of adrenaline because there's a limit to how much adrenaline can be received by, by tissue. So, so going up in, in strengths just means that you can deliver it faster. Uh, maybe you'll get to the max dose a little bit quicker. Um, but from an efficacy perspective, it doesn't actually make a big difference. Um, Dr. Kafoor, yes, I, I, I did spend most of my time talking about adrenaline. We spent a little bit of time looking at the others. Adrenaline is going to be, for most people that are not in the, in the ICU setting, adrenaline is often the, the go-to, although dobutamine and dopamine are also available in most settings. And then we pick the one that is appropriate for the setting, which kind of links to Mr. Hessel's question of dopamine in renal failure, uh, effects are iffy at best. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll buy it that a lot of this is theoretical. And certainly in renal failure, where it's often obstructive in nature, uh, opening up the vasculature is not going to have a major effect on, a, on an obstruction that is often on the filtration end. Um, but I, still, I would still use it over adrenaline if it was a, if it was a renal patient that I was wanting to to look after. Uh, when is it safe to start mobilizing a patient who's on inotropes? Hmm. If they're sick enough to be needing high dose inotropes to keep them alive, they, certainly high dose inotropes, then they're probably nowhere near being able to do out of bed mobilization. They can maybe doing basic physio um, where they are. Um, just be a little bit aware that if they're on uh, some of the chronotropic agents, so if they're on dobutamine or adrenaline, um, you don't want to be doing anything that's going to exert them too much from a cardiac perspective because they're already running a little bit faster than normal. Um, once they get down to their lower dose uh, inotropes, then maybe you can start mobilizing them on inotropes. But I think most of the time, by the time they're looking at certainly out of bed mobilization, they should, they should be coming off. Somebody likes to challenge me. Vasopressors with uh, LVF, uh, Dobutrex versus adrenaline and nitrates. Um, it's often going to be setting specific and how comfortable people are going to be in their setting with playing those against each other. So, for example, in, in a more peripheral setting, I would say that we probably should be doing one or, or the less drugs, the better. So, uh, a dobutamine is maybe a simpler agent for that cardiac patient than trying to combine your adrenaline uh, and your nitrates. Once you're a lot more comfortable with balancing drugs against each other, then you can start doing it and, and tailoring it. It's certainly a lot more accurate because you can have a lot more control. Uh, it also depends on what sort of monitoring you're doing. So, you know, if you're doing vigilator monitoring um, and you're able to monitor uh, flow, particularly peripheral flow, um, you can then use exactly the right agent for what you want. But I would suggest that in settings where we're just wanting to support function as, as, as nicely as possible, then uh, the less agents we have to focus on, the better. And I know we can have a lot more debate around that question, but I'm going to keep it simple for now. Uh, how do we give an adrenaline infusion? I think we've spoken a, quite a bit about that. Um, maybe if you can get this and re-listen to it, you'll get the details. Is no adrenaline better than adrenaline? So it's in a lot of settings considered a little bit safer than adrenaline. Uh, availability in, in a lot of settings are tricky. Um, pick, if we go back to those tables, pick the inotrope that's gonna have the effect that you want. So if I'm just gonna find that comparison table. So for example, if you're looking for an agent that's gonna give you chronotropy with more or less vasoconstriction, uh, you can see the noradrenaline versus adrenaline effects. Um, pick the drug that is the one that you want. Ah, oh, I, I didn't mention that. Thanks, Aisha. Uh, that's actually Using the, the quad strength or double strength adrenaline also means that you're giving less, which means you're not overloading. Uh, cool, that's a very good point to add. 
yeah, if you're if you're if you're in a volume overload problem, I guess that becomes important. And I guess especially when you're dealing with littler people, um, it's also a consideration about uh, about uh, volume. Those are some really cool questions. Thanks, everybody. Are there any others? Uh, hi, Dave. I have a question from Steve Cornish. Is the yeah. typical isotope combination you use in COVID patients, or is it very much patient specific? So having just done a quick review of over a couple of different ICUs, I'm not noticing a trend. It's as with a lot of, uh, a lot of things, uh, groups of intensivists are often kind of having their own opinion and, and following their own strategy. So I don't think that we've found a, a particular one yet. You know, it's like the, the fluid debate, saline versus ringers, and that one will go on for a while yet. Um, nobody's really settled on a particular regimen yet. In, in, the, in the person that is not familiar with inotropes, the best inotrope is the best one that you know, because you're going to get it right the, the quickest and the safest for the patient. Once the emergency is over and the patient's stable, then we can worry about setting up the perfect inotrope. But the one that the patient needs immediately if you're not, particularly if you're not working in ICU all the time, it's going to be the inotrope that you're able to get right the quickest. Cool. Thanks, Dave. I don't see any more questions. Chris? Uh, no, nothing else on my side. Okay. I don't know if you've seen that Chris has posted the YouTube site. Uh, for everybody, it's at the top of this conversation if you want to save it now. And it's the YouTube site where all our videos are currently being posted, our uh, series that we've run so far. And uh, we will make sure that we um, continue to post and you can share it. Please also don't forward the meeting invite to anyone because it creates a loop. Rather send them the link to register for the uh, for the series um, we had uh, 250 people on today which we really appreciate the support um, Dave thank you very much I know that I've been putting a lot of lectures on you and still more to come um, but it was brilliant again um, and that's it I think there was a quick comment on angiotensin 2 and vasopressin do you want to make that comment or do you want Dave to give that comment? Adoremi? So I'll, I'll make a comment on angiotensin 2 and, and vasopressin and that's going to be in settings where they are A, comfortable using those agents and B, where they're readily available. Okay, thank you Dave. I think we're going to end there, David. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, Chris, this one will be posted when? By tomorrow? Uh, I'll try and do it first thing tomorrow morning. So, so just in case you missed the link, the easiest way to find it is just search for the Netcare page on YouTube. Uh, and you can go to playlists and then there's a, there's a Netcare lecture series playlist, uh, which will have all the lectures uh, available there. Stunning. Cool. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. There it is again if you need it. Netcare YouTube. You'll even see a video of me singing. No, I'm only joking. Thanks, Dave. And thanks, Chris. I appreciate the support. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Mandy. Have a good evening, everybody. Chris, can I give you a call? <laughs>